I'm Quinn, founder of Ionic. So our goal is to combine traditional craftsmanship with scalable customization. And we're starting with watches. So that's kind of what I do. And then recently we have a campaign on Indiegogo, so we made some videos and we thought that was pretty nice too. So let's take a look. Now we're looking at the background music here. Unfortunately, the screen is not going on, but I can tell you what's going on, I guess. We make um, watches, quality watches, and then we want it to be something that looks like something that you would get off the store, but then it, at the same time, it's customized. So think Nike ID for shoes, right? Case Defy for cases. But what about watches? Nice watches that you would wear to address watch situation or an environment for dinner for example. We wanted something that's of quality, but then have an individual story. We wanted something that's not so much about branding or brand legacy, but of everyone's story and relationship and passion. So we tried building something that everyone can design their own watch on. Initially, it wasn't easy. Um, we had a designer and customer matching session, and we had all those things trying out. And then eventually, we realized that that's the not scalable part. Right. If you need to have that iteration between the customer and the designer and how to get a design done, it takes a long while. And then also, it never can, a, a designer or even the customer themselves can really understand what they actually want. So that's an interesting thing that we found and then we tried to develop something around it. And that's why we now have a design application. And then where users can select components, design their own watch face, and the fun part is to upload their own names or upload their own images. We have it running on a phone so that you can actually just have add image there and then just scan, let's say, you, you have a Sharpie and you sign your own name on a piece of paper. Well, not your legal signature, but your handwriting of your name. Then you can also include that on your watch. Then we created something quite interesting. We realized that people started using these as wedding gifts, as heirlooms, as all, like all different kind of applications. Custom traditionally comes in in the form of, let's say, color. You print something on top of something, or you basically just mix and match pieces. Or it goes to the very expensive side of things. But there is something vast in the middle where it's a consumer acceptable quality, a fashion quality, something around two to 3,000 Hong Kong dollars, or a couple hundred US dollars, that price range where people would expect quality, fashion, good look, and then they would also want some sort of personalization. Researchers has, have shown that on e-commerce, right, up to 25% of people want some sort of personalization. They just can't figure out how to. There's a vast space in between, and we don't have a lot of players in that. So that's the logical side of why I started this business, is to actually enter and grab a piece of the market. But the actual reason, it's actually a bit biased. So a couple of years ago, I was still a McKinsey consultant, um, having some of the best, well, I believe it's still the best job in the world. Um, it's amazing, I learned so many things. Every day I wake up and at night I go back to my hotel, I know I've created a huge amount of impact. So that kind of feeling, it actually makes you, like you, you, you kind of don't want anything else. But at one point of time, I came back to Hong Kong um, I look at the whole situation around here. I wanted to do something about it, about the startup scene, about young people getting their dreams crushed initially. And then everyone started to get into this startup space to try to help people pursue dreams. And then I saw that. Okay, it's interesting. More and more people are doing that now. And then we want, I wanted to be part of it. So I thought of, okay, how do I create something that's done best in Hong Kong? I want to find what's best in Hong Kong. I don't want Hong Kong to be a second Silicon Valley. I don't want Hong Kong to be a second Boston. Everyone, all the startup hubs around the world have their own identity. Hong Kong should have its own. Shenzhen also has its own identity in IoT. Everyone has the things that they're good at. What's Hong Kong good at? So I asked myself that. It needs to be something with, I guess, also with legacy in Hong Kong, like craftsmanship, fashion, a bit on that. It needs to be something that needs international branding. It needs to be something that takes a bit of the hardware benefit that we have here, which is the prototype in China. 
So I look at all those things and I combine all the business plans that I had, well, when I was with McKinsey, because I, I actually w I went to Stanford, so, so for education, then everything I thought of is, okay, this, this is a business idea. So even within McKinsey, I kept writing down business ideas, right? So after I left McKinsey, I had tons of ideas in front of me, I need to choose from one. Eventually, I chose Ionic because I wanted to do something that's best done here. So I'll share a bit more why I've actually learned that Hong Kong is amazing for startup since two years ago. Now, a bit on the startup mindset that I had on creating this company. I know that it's very common, and in fact, everyone does that, starting a business, thinking of adding value, creating value. So that's where it starts. We want to create a product that helps someone else's lives become better. We want to create a product that someone else wants. And by creating that product, we unfortunately need some costs, obviously. But because we are startups, so this is the thing about startups, is that there is a lot of barriers for their product to be adopted. Branding, reliability, initial rough edges, or marketing simply, because people don't know we exist, right? And as a result, our selling price is lower. So for this table, um, I actually discussed with a professor in HKU. Apparently, for more established brands and established companies, this is on the other side. So where people are actually paying for their created value and the brand value of objects, of goods, cosmetics, think about that, the reliability or the branding that makes you feel safe. So that's a brand value that goes on top. But for us startups, when I created Ionic, I knew that it's going to be a discount. And for me, fortunately, I was creating a hardware startup, then I can actually have a profit in between. For a lot of startups outside, actually, the case is this number is negative. So it's very difficult to actually make a profit initially, and that's why we have that investment game where 18 months you burn on salary, and then after that, hopefully the value, valuation goes up, carries on with creating value, and then eventually it goes to positive. So it takes a lot of discipline marketing to minimize that. But I want to focus on this part. As I've done, like my company is fortunate in a way that we can have profit early, but a lot of my peer companies it's actually reasonably challenging to have profit initially. But what I found out is that they always create values. They always create values. It's just whether it's matched to a customer or matched to an organization. So what I thought of initially, of to just to create something to make myself profitable, it's, it becomes, okay, a lot of startups are creating a lot of values that's being wasted. How do we match that? So I started talking to other investors, advisors, and I realized that sometimes the limitation of newer startup hubs around the world is actually existing corporates have yet to have that practice or faith in startups to adopt what they have created or to identify that value add and then take it to further good for this world. Large companies, back when I was with McKinsey, I help a lot as well, always take data Big data, everyone talks about that these days. And I actually suspect if everyone really knows what it is about, but everyone talks about it. A huge amount of data, okay. Whatever things that you can track. Put together, startups actually use that as well. We track like heat maps on our website. People come to our website, they scroll down like let's say two pages and then they stay there for five minutes, we know that. But that helps us with optimization. So we track data very, very tightly that only helps us improve on our existing product. And 80-20 rules, one of the things that our, us consultants love the most, is that the last 20% of the distance of the optimization takes 80% of the effort. So for, in the, for industries that's more, that's more mature, that's basically what's happening. We get as many information we get. We spend 80% of our effort in getting that extra piece of information to help us optimize the last 5% or 10% so that we can compete with other players around. The thing is, there are always global optimums outside. So I looked at this. I remember I looked at the watch industry, the whole craftsmanship. I knew that back in the 60s, watchmaking was actually quite an interesting field in Hong Kong. And then what happened after that? Fashion, optimization of fashion and branding on designs, on channels, competition on price, on factories in China. 
a lot of those competition, basically, everyone is optimizing to the sense. I remember the first time I got into the industry, someone was actually talking to me and they were, my, one of my suppliers, they were telling me that, I'm sorry, I have to add $1 to this component, $1 Hong Kong dollars, and I'm looking at that. Compared to my math, I'm like, uh, that's nothing. Of course, I need to play that smart entrepreneur look and I'm like, um, let me think about that, right? But the thing is, it's to a point where everyone is making very little across the value chain. And it's become more obvious last year, where in June, in July, in Hong Kong, it almost went down by double digit. But there is an opportunity. What are these, what, what changes these, right? Customer behaviors. Since last year, I think two years, maybe two years ago, Nike ID started some of that. Basically, people start to want customization. And I look at that, okay, that's a changed landscape without people capitalizing. Okay, web technologies. Now we can actually have the server process a lot of things, and then when users use their phone to, to access some sort of web app, it can be as smooth as a, as a native app. Because everything is done on the server side, it doesn't rely on their phone. Things like that. It's been changed for, it's not even just this year, it's been like a year or two already. A lot of these landscape changes. Spending power changes. Luxury side is kind of diminishing. It goes a bit more on the kind of affordable luxury, but a bit above that on the spending pattern. So all these things changes the landscape. The question is how we find this peak. Um, keep in mind that when we're here, we do not see anything around this area, so we actually won't know that this exists unless we go out of our usual way of doing it. In Startup, there's a way we call it neat finding or customer development, however terms you want to um, understand, but um, Stanford has a lot of materials on that on the East Coast as well. That helps us do this. Basically, our team would have like highly customer need inspired execution. And that is very important for us to find this peak. And what I've also realized as time passed, right, to actually go out, venture out into the dark to find this high new global optimum is we need these four things. We need a high, highly agile and lean team, a fully functional team because the marketing cannot be not talking to the supplier cannot be, the, the, the supplier, the supplying, making the engineer making the pass cannot be not talking to the customer. The director needs to know everything, but you think about that, that's actually for a big company, that's really hard. Well, I just talk about the customer need inspired execution, and then we need a matching risk and reward structure. That's also tough. You're venturing out into the dark, startups, less than 10% succeed. So if you think about that, for someone who is already in a big company, leading a team with this kind of expertise, with this kind of vision, going out, it's actually very hard to have a matching risk and reward structure for that team. And when you put these together, right now I can think of two solutions. For very, very innovative companies, I've heard of sniper squats. Sniper squats are basically squats of full, uh, full basically this, in a big company but they answer directly to very senior product development um, teams. And the other more popular one, actually around us, all the time, startups. So that's why I, I always feel like if us startups, these values are being recognized, well, I'm not just talking about mine, but a lot of other startups around Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, China these days. Think of the possibilities that we can achieve together. With the big companies' resources, and this capability of startups. Well, this is the way we do need finding. We go in and we understand all components of needs, which is basically pain relief, desire, and barrier. Pain relief is like Panadol. Panadol solves your headache. The desire is the Panadol's marketing these days. It makes people want something. Another more obvious example, Apple iWatch. I have friends who have to go to a store to persuade themselves that they actually need one. So you think about that, they don't need one, they logically can't justify it, so they figure out ways to justify it themselves, that means their desire is way off the chart. Well, good for Apple to be able to do that, I don't know if they can sustain that though. Um, but, and then there's the barrier part, which is a startup's biggest pain. It's a known brand, someone, a couple kids started something, they might be smart, they might not be, we don't know, and then this product looks good, but then if it doesn't work, it's on my head. Right? 
for people to adopt those startup solutions. So it's actually kind of scary. So this barrier is there. But for us startups, we go out and we understand all these things. And this is not a survey possible process. So big data doesn't help us with this. We go out and we talk to a customer, and it's kind of a bit like gut feeling and art for an entrepreneur. We go out, we understand, we try to push this forward. I went out and I talked to my customers. My first 10 customers, each of them had a one hour call from me. 30 minutes before they get the product, 30 minutes after. And then that, okay, 10. Now that I think about it, is that a significant number? No. If I'm in a boardroom discussion back then with, a cons like with McKinsey and I recommend, okay, I got this 10 data points that tells us that we should do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And then the next question is how do you know that it's not, they're, they're not all outliers, right? And then how do you know that it's not biased? In fact, I would say it's definitely biased. So this is a very different process from my older self's data gathering. It's a very, very different process. But that allows us to iterate very fast. I'm not gonna go into detail of this. This is basically what we do. We do need finding. We create a solution around it. We iterate a cycle. And then we, after we create the solution, we bring the solution who needs it and, and again iterate. The reason why we have to iterate is because each marketing message, each go to market is basically a product. It's a product in itself. The message, the target, the delivery, if you think about it, each marketing message is a product. And in Hong Kong, allow us to do something pretty darn amazing. This is actually, I did not expect it when I started. So we talk about this experimentation point, we iterate here, and then, oh yes, we did need finding, we found that there, and then we tried to optimize again. But startups, we're not always going upwards. Sometimes we find places here, and then we just end up, oh, okay, this doesn't work. Normal, two steps forward, one step back. In Hong Kong, we have a tight-knit community. So that, I, well, I don't know, um, I don't have a lot of experience elsewhere. I've been to Singapore, I've been to um, Jakarta, was in the States for a while, Australia for a while. I would say Hong Kong is a very tight-knit community. They say in the States it's six degree, six phone calls before you can get to anyone. I feel like in Hong Kong it's two or three. Some people look at it as like, okay, if you fail, the whole world knows. But I'd like to look at it from the other side. If you have a good product, the whole world knows as well. So this is interesting. When word of mouth marketing, it's a lot more powerful in Hong Kong than in a lot of other places. So I, I realized not a lot of startups have been leveraging that. And that a lot of startups in Hong Kong are simply just trying to either go to China or go to the States. Sometimes we need to look at what we have in Hong Kong, I feel like. Another thing is a diverse community. We have ads. Uh, I mean, Ionic have ads going out to 30 plus countries. We have a, a portfolio of ads going on every single minute. I think right now they might have paused it because we have trouble fulfilling our Indiegogo campaign stuff. But the idea is if I have ads going to Singapore, I have friends from Singapore and Hong Kong. I have ads going to Russia. I have friends from Russia and Hong Kong. I have Australian friends. I talk to them, I understand what they want, what they like to see not just from the data and it just shows that, oh, this video has less views in this region. Not just that, but I know why. Because in Hong Kong, within two, two or three degrees of my friends, I already know practically people from everywhere. And that allows us, when we iterate, we started last year, um, we launched our brand last year in November. This year, we're already selling to 30 plus countries. We have over 300K followers. I wouldn't say it's a very, very big number, but as a startup, I would say that we did reasonably well. And then in creating a brand follower base, and then now we are like almost a 20 people company. That's because with Hong Kong, with this tight knit community and with this diverse community, we get feedbacks really fast, very diverse feedback with good context. We understand all needs from different parts of the world. Well, we try to at least, I think we do know reasonably well. Of course, it's not as well as I'm being in Japan myself. But I would know things like in Taiwan, gifting a watch has something to do with a significant relationship. Right? So there are those little things that we would learn about here. And it's actually very powerful. And it's still underutilized. So my question for you guys. How will you find the next global optimum? 
just maybe, startups could help. Thanks.